Unfortunately, engineering disasters are a relatively common occurrence. Buildings collapse, bridges fall, and dams break. But sometimes engineering catastrophes happen that are so shocking that they're hard to wrap your head around. This list looks at 10 of these. A warning, this list is substantially darker than many of the previous videos on this channel. If that's not for you, sit this one out and check back next week for a substantially more upbeat video. Starting off the list at number 10, we have the water slide tragedy at the Schlitterbahn Water Park in Kansas City. In 2005, plans were announced for the construction of the first Schlitterbahn Water Park outside the state of Texas. It would be the centerpiece of a larger three quarters of a billion dollar development project on a 350 acre plot of land in Kansas City. Construction began in 2007 and by the summer of 2009, the water park was open for business. It did see some changes due to the recession of 2008, but despite this, when it opened, it included a dozen water rides as well as restaurants and shops. It was expanded in 2011 when six more water rides were added. In 2016 though, a tragic accident occurred one that the park would never recover from. Several years before, in 2012, a new ride was added. After several delays, the ride called Verrucht, German for insane, opened and immediately became the centerpiece of the park. It featured an initial drop of 170 feet before rising back up a 50-foot hump. Riders could reach speeds of up to 60 to 65 miles an hour. Tragically, August 7, 2016, one of the rafts went airborne at the lower hump killing one child and injuring two women. The accident gained massive national attention as the boy killed was the son of a Kansas representative. Right away, the ride was closed and a review began to see what had gone wrong. Engineering reviews determined that the incident had been caused by a series of problems. First, the ride did not meet updated safety codes that would have required an over-the-shoulder harness for riders and an upstop mechanism that would have prevented the raft from going airborne. Despite these issues, the ride had been in use for two years without a similar incident. So what was it that happened on this day that led to such a catastrophic outcome? Engineers determined that the weight distribution in this particular raft was the cause. The young boy, who weighed 74 pounds, was sitting in the front seat. In the two seats behind him were two women who weighed 275 and 197 pounds. Although the combined total of the three was just under the weight limit of 550 pounds, the massively uneven distribution from front to back led to the terrible outcome on this particular ride. The park did reopen shortly after, but its reputation had been ruined. It took a further hit when several more rides were closed for not complying with ride safety standards. 2018 was the last season the park was in operation. The park sat unused for several years as officials tried to determine the best path forward. Ultimately, it was demolished in 2021, and there are plans to rebuild a youth sports complex in its place. On to number nine, we have the Cologne City Archives collapse. In the early 2000s, the German city of Cologne was getting a major upgrade to its transit system. The new underground subway line was planned to run parallel to the Rhine River, approximately one quarter of a mile away. Because they were excavating the tunnel well below the water table, the soils in the area were permeable and dewatering the tunnel was a constant challenge for the construction crew. For the first five years of the project, this was a challenge that was seemingly well managed. As the excavation was nearing completion in 2009, workers began to notice indications that an area near the Cologne Archives building was becoming unstable. They quickly evacuated the area and did their best to alert bystanders. Moments later, the area collapsed. Any collapse is unfortunate, but this one happened to be di directly beneath the Cologne Archives, home to some of the world's most historically significant documents. The archives crashed into the void below, taking as much as 90% of the historical artifacts with it, some of which were over a thousand years old. Sadly, there were also two people in an adjacent building that could not evacuate in time and were killed. Over the next six months, volunteers and historians worked to try to recover as much of the historical documents as they could. Some were saved while others were damaged beyond repair. All told, the collapse was estimated to do over a billion dollars in damage. A lengthy process was held over the next decade to determine fault and consider possible punishments. Constant water running through the permeable soils had led to the creation of voids in the area below the archives, which ultimately became large enough to cause the collapse. Although the fault was placed on the construction company, along with a hefty financial settlement, no one received jail time for the incident. On to number eight, we have the Aquadam tank collapse in Berlin, Germany. The Radisson Hotel in Berlin was one of the most unique hotels in the world thanks to its massive five-story aquarium 
featured prominently in the hotel atrium, holding almost a quarter of a million gallons of water and nearly 1,500 fish this hotel provided unforgettable memories to countless travelers passing through Berlin. Guests could ride a clear elevator up through the aquarium and get an up-and-close look at many of the fish. That was until Friday, December 16, 2022. On that day at 5.45 a.m., without warning, the tank ruptured and sent a cascade of water through the lobby and out onto the street. Surprisingly, only two people were injured, but unfortunately, nearly all the fish were killed in the collapse. The collapse devastated parts of the hotel and caused millions of dollars in damage. While this incident was extremely unfortunate, many have pointed out how, how much worse it could have been had it happened later in the day. Investigators and engineers sifted through the rubble. Material fatigue was pointed to as a possible cause, potentially exacerbated by a large temperature differential between the relatively warm water temperature and the cold Berlin air. Next up, we have the Aggie Bonfire Collapse. It was a tragic event that happened November 18, 1999 at Texas A&M University. At approximately 2.45 a.m., a 59-foot a high stack of logs consisting of about 5,000 timber pieces collapsed during its construction. This devastating accident resulted in the deaths of 12 people and injured 27 others. The bonfire was an annual tradition at Texas A&M, built by students in preparation for the football game against their rival, the University of Texas. The collapse was caused by multiple factors, including excessive internal stresses on the logs and inadequate wiring strength. The incident shocked the campus and the nation, leading to immediate rescue efforts and an outpouring of support from the community and rival schools. In the aftermath, Texas A&M established a commission to investigate the collapse. Their findings revealed that the bonfire construction had become such a complex process that it required professional engineering oversight. The tragedy led to the cancellation of the official university-sanctioned bonfire, though students would later establish an off-campus version. On to number six, we have the Boston Molasses Disaster. In 1915, the Purity Distillery Company completed work on a massive molasses tank. Molasses would be stored here for the use in the production of ethanol. The tank, which stood five stories tall and was 90 feet in diameter, could hold up to 2.3 million gallons of molasses. Reports suggest that the tank leaked from the first time it was filled. The leaking was so substantial that the tank was actually painted brown to cover up the obvious leaks. Later investigations revealed that the tank was poorly built, thinner than it should be, and, and used much more brittle metals than they should have used in construction. In addition to the poor construction, there's strong evidence that the maintenance of the tank was not performed properly. Groaning sounds could be heard when the tank was filled. Four years later, on January 15, 1919, a day before the 18th Amendment was ratified, which would outlaw alcohol, the tank was filled to capacity. This was only the eighth time in the tank's life that it was filled completely. Unfortunately, this time, it failed catastrophically, sending a 25-foot-tall wave of molasses through the surrounding area. The three-story tall wave moved at up to 35 miles per hour. Buildings were torn from their foundations, and any people who were unfortunately caught in the wave were helpless against it. As the molasses spread, it began to cool, making it even more viscous and making it harder and harder to escape. Ultimately, 21 people were killed and 150 people were injured. The neighborhood was devastated, with nearly all buildings suffering severe damage. The cleanup took weeks, and reportedly the area still smelled strongly of molasses for years, particularly on hot summer days. At number five, we have the Chicago Porch Collapse of 2003. This incident was a structural collapse that happened June 29, 2003 in the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago's north side. During a party at an apartment building, an overloaded third floor balcony collapsed, causing a chain reaction that brought down the second and first floor balconies as well. This disaster resulted in 13 deaths and 57 serious injuries, making it the deadliest porch collapse in American history. The collapse happened shortly after midnight when approximately 50 people were on the top wooden balcony. Witnesses reported hearing the sound of splintering wood just before the structure gave way. The ensuing investigation revealed numerous construction errors and code violations in the balcony's design and build. In the aftermath, the city of Chicago conducted sweeping inspections of similar structures across the city resulting in over 1,200 cases requiring action. The incident sparked debates about building safety and the responsibilities of property owners. Despite the initial claims of overcrowding being the primary cause, ultimately poor construction was determined to be the main factor. At number four, we have the big game disaster. The Thanksgiving Day disaster of 1900 stands as a chilling reminder of how quickly joy can turn into tragedy. 
on November 29, 1900, as the California Golden Bears and the Stanford Cardinals prepared to clash in their annual rivalry game. Excitement filled the air in San Francisco's Mission District. Little did anybody know that this day would soon become one of America's deadliest sporting events. As kickoff approached, a crowd of 500 to 1,000 eager spectators, unwilling to pay the $1 admission fee, made a fateful decision. They climbed atop the nearby San Francisco and Pacific Glassworks factory, seeking a free view of the game. The factory's roof was never designed to bear such weight and groaned and deflected under the strain. Twenty minutes into the game, disaster struck. With a sickening crack, the roof gave way, plunging hundreds of spectators into a nightmare. Some of them fell four stories onto the factory floor, while others faced an even more horrific fate. Sixty to a hundred people plummeted directly onto the massive furnace, its surface sitting at around 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Amidst the chaos, the game continued. At the same time, factory workers were faced with an unimaginable horror, using metal poles to try to drag the bodies off the scorching furnace. The disaster claimed the lives of 23 people and left over a hundred others with serious injuries. Funeral processions became a constant sight in the following days, with nine victims buried in a single Sunday. Today, 125 years later, few people remember the Thanksgiving Day disaster, but it stands as one of the deadliest sporting incidents in American history. Next up, we have the Val Reefs mine disaster. It's one of the most tragic and bizarre accidents in all of mining history. It occurred in South Africa's Val Reefs gold mine, one of the largest employing over 40,000 workers and producing 70 tons of gold annually. On the fateful night of May 10th, 1995, 104 workers were ascending a double-story elevator after completing their shift, approximately 2,000 meters below the surface. Unbeknownst to them, disaster was hurtling down from above. A 12-ton underground locomotive several hundred meters above them had entered the wrong tunnel and gone out of control. It crashed through a safety barrier which had been designed for much smaller equipment and plunged into the mine shaft. The locomotive struck the ascending elevator, snapping its cable. Both the locomotive and the elevator plummeted almost a half a kilometer to the bottom of the shaft. The impact was catastrophic, compressing the elevator to just a third of its original size. Tragically, all 104 miners perished in what became the worst elevator accident in history. Rescue efforts were grim and harrowing. Recovery teams had to use blowtorches to cut through the mangled wreckage, retrieving body parts piece by piece. The disaster exposed serious safety failures. Investigations revealed that the locomotive had been parked in a prohibited area, and an electrical circuit had been bypassed, disabling crucial safety mechanisms. Moreover, the mine had failed to implement urgent safety measures recommended after a similar non-fatal incident three years prior. This tragedy led to significant changes in the mining industry, including the immediate implementation of a new Health and Safety Act. It also resulted in the establishment of the Valerie's Disaster Trust, benefiting 431 dependents of the deceased miners across five countries. Down to number two, we have the Mecca Crane Collapse. On September 11, 2015, the bustling city of Mecca was preparing for the annual Hajj pilgrimage. The Grand Mosque, Islam's holiest site, was undergoing expansion to accommodate the ever-growing crowds. As the afternoon call to prayer echoed across the city, dark clouds gathered on the horizon, which started as a typical sandstorm quickly intensified, with winds reaching speeds of 65 miles per hour. At 5.10 p.m. local time, disaster struck. A massive crawler crane, one of many dotting Mecca's skyline began to sway dangerously in the fierce gusts. There was a deafening roar as the 200-foot-tall behemoth toppled into the crowded mosque complex. The aftermath was devastating. 111 people lost their lives, with nearly 400 others being injured. The victims represented a cross-section from the Muslim world hailing from countries as diverse as Egypt, Pakistan, and Indonesia. In the following days, questions arose about the safety protocols and accountability. The Saudi bin Laden group, responsible for the crane's operation, also faced intense scrutiny. The incident would not only reshape Mecca's skyline, but also its approach to construction safety in the, one of the world's most visited religious sites. And finally, at number one, we have the Hyatt Regency walkway collapse. Work began on the Hyatt Regency in Kansas City in early 1978. When complete, the hotel would be the tallest in the state, standing over 500 feet tall. The centerpiece of the hotel was a large, multi-story atrium in a series of elevated walkways overlooking the lobby below. Walkways for the second and fourth floors were directly over top of each other, 
while the third floor walkway was slightly offset. On July 17, 1981, over, over 1,500 attendees gathered for a large dance. A majority of those in attendance packed the ground floor, but others began to move up to the skywalks for a better view. As dozens began to fill up these spaces, a popping sound could be heard from the fourth floor walkway. Almost immediately, it failed catastrophically crashing down to the lobby below, bringing with it the second floor walkway as well. The result was the deadliest non-intentional structural collapse in American history, taking the lives of 114 people and injuring 216 others. Following the disaster, intensive investigations were done. These revealed a number of flaws that led to the collapse. First, a last-minute design change switched the second and fourth floor walkways from having a single rod holding both to having offset rods for each. This shifted the load and resulted in extra straps being put on the nuts at the end of each rod. Next, even the original design did not meet Kansas City building codes, with some estimates putting it at only about 60% of what code required. Additionally, there was miscommunication about the orientation of the C-channel strips supporting the walkway Unfortunately, one of the weakest configurations was selected. This tragedy was absolutely devastating and its effects have rippled through the engineering field for decades. It's highlighted the importance of building in substantial safety margins and ensuring the best possible communication during the building process between all parties involved.